earlier. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, uh, we are very happy to welcome such a distinguished panel and participants uh, at our event. We will uh, start with uh, both of our ambassadors addressing our roundtable, and then I'm sure we'll have a very fruitful discussions addressing both uh, the wider topic of uh, the world order and the COVID-19 pandemic influence on that and BRICS issues, but also uh, looking more into Russian-Indian relations and what our two countries, uh, our uh, pillars, I believe, uh, strong pillars of today's world are to bring to this uh, world, to make it stable, to make it predictable, to make it safe for all, and to make it uh, livable and good to live in. And uh, that said, we will uh, obviously introduce everyone uh, later on, but now allow me to give the floor to His Excellency Nikolai Kudashev, the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Russian Federation, uh, to Republic of India, and he will give his video address now. Friends, Miss Victoria Panova, Mr. Nandanuni Krishna, distinguished participants, I highly appreciate your kind invitation for this important event, which is extremely timely in the context of global developments and our competence to manage the foreseeable future. The proposed agenda items of today's discussion are therefore vital. We are very satisfied with cooperation with the India in the bilateral format, as well as in the framework of BRICS, especially amid the Russian chairmanship in the grouping in 2020. The COVID-19 outbreak brought a lot of changes in our life. And this is a challenge for the international relations as well. Against this, this background, it is particularly important that the principles which represent the basis of our special and privileged strategic partnership remain unchanged, namely mutual respect, commitment to the central role of the United Nations, etc. Together, we are moving towards just and equal multipolar world. That is why our interaction continue growing, even during the pandemic. Uninterrupted is the dialogue between the leaders, ministers, national security advisors, and senior officials. The visit of Defense Minister Rajnath Singh to Moscow for the military parade on June 24 on the Red Square, which was dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the victory of the Soviet Union in the Great Patriotic War, also demonstrated true friendship and camaraderie between our peoples. We enjoyed exceptional cooperation against COVID-19 including by supplies of vital medicine and mutual support on the repatriation of stranded nationals. 2020 is a very special year in our times. We celebrate the 20th anniversary of the strategic partnership between the two countries, the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War and the creation of the United Nations, witness the Russian chairmanship in BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and RIC. Thus, we have an extended agenda aimed at widening our practical cooperation in the new conditions. At the same time, as we speak about the future of the world order, it is equally important that it should be based on international law, and clear principles of the United Nations Charter. The COVID-19 threat represents opportunity to unite efforts against the common challenge, and that is why the relevance of BRICS is growing. 
offering platforms for dialogue on a wide range of issues of global and regional cooperation, as well as practical partnership between the five nations. BRICS was not invented to fight or contain anyone rather than to support efforts of the international community on the issues related to peace and sustainable development, democratization of global governance, financial and economic architecture reform, promotion of humanitarian contacts. At the same time, we are against any unilateral, geopolitically motivated actions and illegal extraterritorial sanctions which create instability, mistrust, and unpredictability. This shared approach is vividly materialized in our growing coordination in various United Nations bodies, G20, East Asian Summit, OPCW, and other structures. We proceed from the understanding that search for the unifying agenda and the expansion of the common ground to find solution for global challenges will remain a priority for us. Today, when India is preparing to take over as the United Nations Security Council non-permanent member for 2021-2022, there are increasing expectations that we will further enhance our coordination within BRICS on the current international agenda. We believe that moving towards these tasks, we will approach the upcoming summit of BRICS in St. Petersburg this autumn with solid achievements and plans, which would lay ground for the coming Indian chairmanship in the grouping in 2021. Today's conference is a very important event in our tight calendar for this special year. I would like to wish the organizers and participants a fruitful discussion, providing for a comprehensive assessment of the prospects of our bilateral and multilateral interaction, which no doubt will further increase its importance as a crucial factor in world affairs. Thank you. Dear friends, Miss Victoria Panov, uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, that was an enlightening speech indeed. And uh, this would be our great honor and uh, in, um, admi admiration to hear a welcoming address from His Excellency, Mr. Venkatesh Varma, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of India to the Russian Federation. Uh, Mr. Varma, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon and greetings from Moscow, uh, Dr. Panova, our, uh, His Excellency, my dear colleague in Delhi, uh, Ambassador Kudashev, uh, dear friends uh, in India, <coughs> uh, from the ORF, uh, Dr. Sami Saran, Nandan, Nune Krishnan, uh, and uh, of course our friends here in Moscow. And uh, you know, uh, it's good to be here on this very important topic as we uh, look forward to working with Russia as the chair of the BRICS uh, of, for 2020 uh, to see how we can strengthen the hands of the host country to ensure a successful BRICS summit uh, when that is held later this year. <clears throat> the foreign ministers of uh, BRICS countries will be meeting in early September in Moscow, uh, which will give uh, the ministers an opportunity to review uh, ongoing developments and see how uh, we can strengthen the core principles of BRICS and uh, adapt BRICS to the new <clears throat> challenges that have arisen, uh, which we've all witnessed during the course of the year. And I must say, uh, uh, India and Russia cooperate in several international forums, the UN, and uh, we thank Russia for the support that it has given us for our non-permanent seat, which we will occupy between 2021 and 22. And we look forward to working with Russia <coughs> to make our presence a, a success. Uh, in the G20, in the SEO, 
uh, in other fora, uh, we have uh, we have common interests. But I think uh, <clears throat> whatever our engagement in multilateral fora, our the resilience of the strategic partnership bilaterally, I think imposes on us a certain responsibility to ensure that our participation uh, adds value to all the multilateral organizations that we participate in. And I'm absolutely confident that the solidarity uh, that the international, uh, that the strategic partnership between India uh, and Russia provides an anchor, an anchor around which a lot of other multilateral activity can, can take place. So essentially what I'm saying is that um, despite all the forums that we engage in, our bilateral relationship as far as India is concerned occupies primacy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Russia. Uh, I completely endorse uh, Ambassador Kudashev's comments on our bilateral relationship and the agenda for the future. Uh, let me focus my comments on what we can do in the context of BRICS. Uh, the BRICS came about with a promise to make a difference. And I think this time around, there will be an expectation uh, both amongst various BRICS countries and of course the international community on whether BRICS can live up to that standard because the global yardsticks of assessing the viability and relevance of international organizations has sharply risen uh, because of the various very complicated uh, international situation. We've, we've seen that in the context of G20. Uh, everybody agrees that G20 in 20, 2008 uh, was a huge success. Uh, its success in 2020 in addressing the pandemic appears, uh, well, well, we'll wait and see. Uh, we don't want that same question mark to arise with vis-a-vis vis uh, vis BRICS. So with respect to the pandemic, I think there are a couple of ideas that we, uh, we need to address. One is the importance of national resilience. And there are very interesting parallels between how India has approached the COVID pandemic and how in Russia has approached. And I think uh, mutual sharing of experiences uh, and lessons learned, I think, is something that we can um, that we can look at. Yesterday, we had a conversation on through video conference between the medical devices manufacturers of India and Russia. And this is a practical aspect of cooperation, and of course, medical devices industry has boomed uh, globally. <laughs> But India and Russia have special capabilities and talents in this regard. And we saw a lot of commonalities. So I think opportunities which are not generally visible uh, in normal circumstances, I think extraordinary circumstances and times bring forth new, uh, new opportunities. And I think um, you know, we should look for that. Secondly, I think uh, there is uh, an interest in avoiding over-dependence on old and comfortable supply chains, which of course uh, don't suddenly seem to work when, when, they are, they are, when they are most required. So I think an exchange of views on that is, uh, is, is also important. Thirdly, the concept of international responsibility. When uh, you, uh, you're faced with uh, an international crisis, of course, it is necessary to protect your own interests, but that protection of your own interests gives uh, should be the basis for you to to handle uh, the international to contribute to the international situation. I think <clears throat> all of us who travel in airlines, <clears throat> the um, the aerostas always tells us that when there is a, a drop in cabin pressure, the 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 mass will fall down um, from the ceiling, and you, uh, the first priority is to put it onto yourself so that you are. Uh, not for entirely for selfish reasons. I think it's necessary for that you stabilize yourself first before you are in a position to help others. Uh, that I think is absolutely necessary. Um, we also need to define the global good because I think the global good comes into sharper focus 
uh, when uh, situations such such as this arise, and um, I would say that the BRICS should step forward um, because uh, its original promise and its original charter, uh, at least internationally, was meant to make a difference to the world. And now the time has come to see how we can make a difference. Uh, now, for example, uh, uh, I think we should agree on uh, how reform of the multilateral institutions can be accelerated, could, could, should be made more purpose-driven. Uh, the WHO is a good point in example, uh, in, uh, uh, is, is a good example. Uh, we all agree that the WHO plays an important role, but obviously there is need for reform. And I think we should come up with <clears throat> our own expectations, which we can bring to the larger international community on how w, uh, WHO reform can take place uh, in a more purposeful, uh, uh, in a more purposeful manner. Um, similarly, the definition of the global good, I think will come up for a very uh, important test uh, when, the, uh, when these various vaccines that are being developed uh, in different parts of the world, and uh, we look forward with with uh, with great interest as as Russia makes progress, um, we we are making progress in India as well. But whatever these vaccines, I think the definition of a global good <coughs> is is something that we will need to um, that we, we that we would need to see. Um, recently, the India and the EU had a had a had a joint statement after the summit level at the at the uh, uh, through a DVC, and I think there were some you know, there were some important uh, uh, important uh, yardsticks there. <coughs> Let me also say that <coughs> BRICS also has uh, unique characteristics in terms of uh, global outreach. I mean, we are from <coughs> truly different continents. Uh, different uh, areas, and I think each of us from our own region uh, needs to reflect the larger interests of our own region. And India took a major step forward as as soon as the pandemic began. I think our prime minister went forward and 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 conducted and and organized uh, a SARC uh, get together of leaders to see how we could coordinate and help each other. Uh, that is uh, that was an extremely positive. Um, a positive development. So BRICS, as in BRICS, I think, uh, needs to put together the interest from Africa, from Latin America, of course, from Asia and the Eurasian region. Uh, lastly, I think uh, uh, we, we, we congratulate Russia for keeping up the BRICS dialogue. Uh, the BRICS uh, commerce ministers will be speaking shortly, uh, despite all the complications that the world has witnessed uh, with re respect to global governance, at least the, the conversations have continued. And I think that is an absolutely um, important aspect of global governance. Conversations must continue. And I think Russia in its chairmanship of BRICS has, has contributed and we'd like to thank them and, and, and wish them all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, You've touched upon very important points, and I believe we will need to address all of those. And, and indeed, you're right, BRICS was introduced, was there to, to make a difference. And we are hoping that we're still relevant for that. And that is why, uh, while we've achieved a significant progress in a number of areas, it is vital not to stay where we are, we saw that their current pandemics have in fact exacerbated all the existing problems. Instead of uh, seeing everyone look into the common good, into their uh, joint future, look the humanist, take the humanistic approach, we saw the world, uh, most of uh, countries that have to be taking the lead, uh, going into national egoisms and instead showing uh, them not ready for such leadership and showing they're not ready for uh, leaving their uh, needs behind, but rather addressing the common good. And BRICS, uh, in, while um, we still need to see what BRICS can make, how BRICS can make a significant change. 
yes, we do have a very intense tissue of cooperation that's happening uh, uh, so far. Uh, you rightly mentioned all the mechanisms and all the meetings that were held uh, for now uh, within the BRICS. Uh, there are a number of issues that we are taken upon, including uh, in the area of healthcare, and definitely WHO reform is a very important agenda, and BRICS is there to keep up the reform of the multilateral organizations and actually to ensure their credibility and their uh, usefulness to the world. And that is why uh, we cannot just be calm and happy because for example, we yet in 2018, we talked about the vaccine center back in South Africa. We still don't have it functioning. We're talking about all our countries developing vaccines. And uh, it is true that we need to take more actions uh, to ensure uh, faster and better cooperation in these and other areas. Uh, among those, I can name one of the initiatives that we came up with as, a, as experts was their joint um, education of tracers uh, in, in their situation of pandemics uh, between the BRICS. And uh, obviously it is very important that BRICS is there not to only show the lead and to improve the quality of life of their own populations, but also to show the way and improve uh, the situation of, uh, of the regions where all of our countries are uh, seen as leaders. Uh, without further ado, I would like to first of all say that my Fellow co-chair today would be Mr. Nandan Unikrishnan, Distinguished Fellow of the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, we are very much looking uh, forward to seeing him back with his video on once he, um, uh, his internet connection improves. Uh, but now I would like for us to uh, further move into the agenda and uh, start the first part of our today's uh, meeting and the session which would be addressing uh, their uh, emerging world order with their how the COVID-19 influenced it, how the BRICS can be um, helpful in order for this world order to be in the interest of uh, the developing world of uh, not just our five countries and uh, how to manage all the turbulences and the crisis that were exacerbated, as I said uh, earlier, um, with the help of uh, our two countries and the BRICS in, in general. And uh, that said, I would like to give the first floor to Dr. Sergei Lunev, who is a professor of the Oriental Studies Department of their um, Gimma University, and he will uh, give us his um, view on uh, what, what we are here to see further on. Oh, thank you very much. Mm, first of all, mm, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to such an enlightened audience. In my opinion, the repercussions of the pandemic are not seen clearly now. Some experts began to make forecasts about the end of globalization. I am not so sure about it. The same situation was a dozen years ago when the world economic crisis began, but nothing really has happened. On the other hand, now we have the second wave of the economic globalization. The first one was more than 100 years ago, and it was stopped by the First World War. So the, re the results of this pandemic can be different. Uh, the creation of polycentric and multi-civilizational world seems to be the main way of modern world. Previously, the basis of civilizational differences and inter-civilizational contradictions were mainly due to socio-religious and cultural factors 
but not to economic ones. Nevertheless, it is the economic parameters that have played extremely significant role in the current change in the global development. With the exception of information globalization, economic globalization has developed most rapidly in recent time. It is not so with uh, political globalization, not to say about civilizational globalization. This process was caused both by transformations in national economies and in the world economy and by political reasons, for example, by the liquidation of the socialist camp. Economic globalization by placing specific countries and social groups in more favorable conditions and uh, making the situation of other countries worse has aggravated social problems throughout the world. The social wave of protests cover all Western Europe and the United States and the COVID-19 has complicated the situation. We can, in my opinion, only explain, expect an increase in social protest, especially when we take into account that the Western labor market doesn't demand now qualified personnel. Uh, it requires almost exclusively unskilled workers and highly qualified workers. The transformation of the world system is a complex knot of intertwining economic, socio-economic, political and geopolitical problems. Members of the world system, on the one hand, are forced to adapt to these processes and on the other to change them in their own interests. Of course, only countries with huge potential can change this processes and Russia and India are among these countries. I am not a diplomat or official uh, serviceman, that's why I'm a freelancer, so I, I'll not uh, smooth things over and uh, be in tight of uh, quarantine, I try to be absolutely frank. The West has been Russia's traditional enemy for 500 years, starting with Ivan the First Livonian War in the 16th century. After the end of the bipolar period, the strategic goal of the developed countries in relation to Russia was uh, to maintain uh, the status quo. They needed a weakened country, but not chaos, the development of raw materials industries, but not high tech, the dismantling of military power, but at the same stage, not final. Not final. The United States, of course, also sought to eliminate Russia's independent influence on world events. Oh, frankly speaking, the USA is the most aggressive power in the world. I know that in India, you used to say about the aggressive foreign policy of China, but please name any war that China began after 1979 and the war with Vietnam. If we speak about the United States, uh, we'll name a lot of wars and uh, the millions were killed during these wars. After Russia rose from its knees, the positions of Western political forces that wanted to destroy the country completely were sharply strengthened. The European Union, while remaining an economic giant, is becoming a political dwarf. Its only strategy is to follow in the footsteps of American foreign policy, which in general leads gradually to the deprivation of their status as important actors in foreign policy. 
European poles can only slightly deviate from this position in the case of the American policy of unilateralism as it was during the first term of George Bush Jr. and under present President Trump. Uh, India is undoubtedly the world power and has become a special subsystem of international relations. Uh, this formation, yes, absolutely the same can be said about China. And this formation seems to have been accelerated by the collapse of the world socialism. In a controlled world, this process would have met with much greater obstacles. In the near future, Asian giants may become rivals of the United States in the fight for leadership. History repeats itself. Rivals appear on the periphery. But whether India or China can become a leader depends on the interaction of many factors. Less likely candidates for the status of a global center of influence are Russia, Brazil, the European Union, and Japan. For the United States, the following factors are potentially dangerous. One, Asian giants do not belong to the privileged part of the world economic system, which means that they are not happy with the rules of the game imposed by the developed countries. And second, an independent foreign policy has always been the main goal of China and India, and subordination to anyone doesn't fit into their plans. The hegemony of the West is rejected by these countries for political, economic, and civilizational reasons. Uh, this situation, in my opinion, explains the external paradox, India's active participation in the BRICS format. If the bilateral Indo-Chinese relations are characterized by a very large number of problems, and the basic one is the lack of confidence in each other, then, on the contrary, there is a noticeable Indian-American rapprochement. It is the global level that turns daily away from the USA towards BRICS. The BRICS countries are outwardly the main global force that opposes the transformation of the world system into a monopolar one. Oh, I'll be absolutely frank. In my opinion, Brazil and South Africa are weak companions of Russia, India, and China. Brazil considers itself a part of the West, and the vast majority of Brazilian population considers so. And Brazil's presence in the organization seems quite ineffective. South Africa is on a downward path in economic terms during the last 30 years. And its potential doesn't match the Eurasian powers. Unemployment, poverty, and equality in this country um, are among the highest in the world, and the real economic growth rate is very low. Thus, we must either return to the RIC format, and I am a great fan of this format, or invite either major non-Western countries, Mexico, Argentine, Indonesia, Iran, Nigeria, some other ones. Within the framework of BRICS, there was a focus, first of all, on the coordination of actions in the sphere of the international economic relations. Meanwhile, a new intensification of economic and political cooperation within the framework of the RIC is also quite promising. Thus, it is interesting to combine Russian fundamental science and resources 
Indian engineering and Chinese material production. The obtained product, in my opinion, would have a big market. It may also be promising to establish to establish joint activities in such areas as the agrosphere, joint development of mineral, fuel, energy, and forest resources in Siberia. Dr. Lunyov, you have two minutes more. Uh, okay, mm, maybe I'll speak about it uh, not so short uh, in the second part uh, of our meeting, but I'll name, uh, in my opinion, the main key negative factor in Russia-Indian bilateral political relations. It is the psychological perception of the elite of their part. During the third wave of Indian migration, a powerful Indian diaspora was formed in North America and Europe that occupies a rather privileged position in the new homeland. Among the Indian elite, there are almost no individuals who do not now have relatives or close friends among American citizens. This situation has led to the emergence of political leaders in India calling for focusing exclusively on Washington, which may lead to the destruction of a half century old consensus on foreign policy. Russian elite is also pro-Western, not pro-American, but pro-European. The Russian elite still firmly believes in the Eurocentric ideal model, has an obvious inferiority complex in relation to Europe, and is traditionally extremely pessimistic about their own country, which has always led to real cynicism, was in Tsarist period, in the Soviet period, and now. Uh, so uh, I am sorry uh, for, be, uh, for speaking to long. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lunev. Uh, we are we're sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sh quite sure that uh, it would have been great to listen to all our speakers for uh, much longer, but we do have uh, uh, limitations on time. And uh, particularly now, allow me to, without further ado, to give the floor to Dr. Samir Saran, who is the president of the Observer Research Foundation. And not only that, but he's been our long friend uh, in both BRICS and in Russia-India relations. And we've done a lot of really great things and uh, launched lots of initiatives together. And uh, he's always been a very reliable friend. And, uh, uh, I think one of their most prominent political scientists and analysts uh, globally, and who is always very um, interesting to listen to his insights uh, and in, in quite a few areas. And that is why it, uh, we're really le looking forward to your uh, comments and your speech now, Dr. Saran. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Thank you, Nandan, for uh, organizing this very important conversation at a very important juncture as both uh, uh, the ambassadors have uh, highlighted in their intervention and as uh, Professor Luna has already um, uh, in some sense expounded on. Let me make uh, uh, four very short points because I don't want to uh, take too much of clock time. I think um, the big world order, order questions that uh, flow from the pandemic are not necessarily connected to the pandemic. They are questions that have been exaggerated and. Uh, placed before us rather brutally due to the pandemic. So I think these are lingering issues which have come to a head around this moment when we are coping with the health crisis. The first big question that this pandemic has posed before all of us is who is going to be the underwriter, the uh, custodian of the world order? Uh, whether we liked America or we hated America, the fact was Americans spent a lot of their treasury they spent a lot of their political and military force in keeping the sea lane safe, in uh, keeping our order in trade, in ensuring technology was available and accessible to many around the world, in creating a stable financial system that allowed money to move, in ensuring the flights reached on time, 
in ensuring the telephone calls never switched off, even during a bombing raid. So uh, we can criticize them, we can like them, we can dislike them. That is a personal belief. But the world order for the last 20 years, at least ever since the end of the Soviet Union, was underwritten by American power. What the pandemic tells us is that America was absent as the world was responding to this crisis. The absence of America from a global crisis is the first in my lifetime. I've never been in a, uh, in a global scale situation where Captain America has disappeared. The aspirant to Captain America's throne, uh, Captain Xi Jinping, uh, was incriminated in causing the crisis. So we have one powerful country which is uh, uh, away from the crisis and is staying outside the crisis and is creating a mess for their own people. And we have a second uh, big power that is inc incriminated on how the pandemic uh, scaled up and reached all our shores. So we have the top two countries both being shown in very poor light courtesy the pandemic. And this is in many ways the challenge the world order faces, that one doesn't want to be the most powerful country in the world, the other is not ready to be the most powerful country in the world. So how do we create an undergirding? How do we create a club of co a coalition of countries that will provide stability, safety, prosperity, and peace in these most challenging times? And therefore, countries like Russia and India and the partnership between Russia and India is extremely crucial to help us tide over this uncertain moment where the G1 has left and the G2 is not ready. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the bilateral becomes extremely vital. We will have to invest more in it. We cannot continue to do what we've been doing for the past 10 to 15 years. We have to now become far more active in creating solutions, not only for the region we occupy, but as uh, both the ambassadors mentioned, for other geographies as well. So that's the first world order question. The second issue is that even as the world reaches an uncertain political moment, we are also seeing uh, upheaval in its economic assumptions. The old assumptions around economics are no longer going to be valid going ahead. As we enter the fourth industrial revolution, as technology becomes the most dominant driver of economic value creation, as manufacturing is replaced by 3D printing and becomes a service, as distant uh, retail and, and uh, uh, bits and bytes produce more value than the movement of oil and energy, we will all have to reconfigure our own economic models and therefore our bilateral relationships. So while energy and minerals and raw, and, and raw materials will remain an important part of the potential between India and Russia, I think the sky is the limit if India and Russia put together a partnership of the future where we become uh, a, a brother in arms to build one of the most sophisticated fourth industrial revolution frameworks where the distance of geography, the tyranny of geography is removed, where Vladivostok and Bangalore can co-create the most formidable um, IT and ITES and internet of thing based uh, economic framework. And I think that potential is huge. So I think we have to also understand that in this economic upheaval, there are new opportunities, technology, but there are also huge challenges because some of those old economic institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, and the central banking institutions, uh, the currency management exchanges, the commodity management exchanges are all going to become redundant. A whole new economic architecture for the 20, 21st century is still to be built. And it is important that Russia and India become partners in this project that will involve many others to put together an economic framework that is durable for the future. I think that's the second world order question that we need to start thinking about. The third is trade and technology. I'm going back to technology, but in a different context. A context. I think the assumptions that globalization is liked by everyone and global trade is meant to uh, bring prosperity to every person is certainly not a view shared by many national leaders and nationalistic leaders and certainly even non-nationalistic leaders. I think uh, global trade is facing its biggest threat in the last 30 years, since 1990. I think this is the uh, most challenging time for global trade and not only because the WTO is... Uh, possibly going to uh, uh, collapse, but also because the idea that we can have shared trade that benefits all is not necessarily a virtue that many cater to. Uh, and I think this is an important point to understand that the model of globalization going ahead is also up for grabs. We will have to recast uh, the, the assumptions around globalization together and India and Russia have a role to play in this, whether in the format that you mentioned, Rick, whether bilaterally 
or whether through larger plurilateral groupings like SEO and BRICS. But the fact is globalization is at its weakest. And if globalization as a project has to survive, it requires radical, uh, radical energy and radical reform. And that's something that we need to be thinking about. So these are my three big world order questions, um, a new trading arrangement, new economics, and new politics that is likely to flow from the pandemic. Let me give you three more concrete and practical ideas and then uh, close. That's my fourth point. We can do three things together in more immediate and practical terms, which are uh, uh, essential for our people, our country, and of course, uh, the various uh, partnerships that we have uh, together or individually. I think the first is that uh, can Russia and India partner to ensure the vaccine that we build, the medical protocols that we uh, record, the treatments that we discover are available to all? And can we uh, use uh, our partnership to ensure the vaccines you create and we create and the medicines that we build is that, that we have are taken to the last miles in Africa, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world? And I think uh, India-Russia partnership for responding to the health component of the pandemic could be something different. Uh, our relationship is normally seen as a strong relationship around defense and security and energy. I think let's bring some uh, uh, human focused, people centered in, uh, uh, endeavors into our relationship so that our relationship becomes more popular amongst our people. The reason why our people are more distant than our elites are because our elites are more focused on security and energy and economics, while people, uh, for the people, SDGs and health and other issues matter more. So if the Russia India partnership can transform to include elements of health and economy and human capital and issues that matter to people, it can become a more popular relationship in both our countries, in, in our cities, in our states, in our provinces, amongst our different communities. So that's the first idea. The second, of course, is that we are all going to have to recover our economies next year or the year after that. Once this crisis is past us, or even, even while we grapple with the crisis, we have to create a stimulus package. Can we work together through the new development bank? Can we work together bilaterally? Can we work together through international institutions, financial institutions? Can we create um, a basis, uh, modest maybe, because we are not either China or Russia or the US, uh, uh, sometimes partnering with one, sometimes with the other. Can we build a framework for recovery? Can it be a recovery that is sustainable? Can it be a recovery that is gender-led? Can it be a recovery that uh, makes us achieve our 2030 goals as, as humanity? So can we create ideas because we are thinkers you are thinkers we are thinkers both of us have spent more time thinking than doing that's why the americans and chinese are bigger economies but can we as thinkers put together frameworks that can be popularized and i think that is something that we need to think about an economic recovery the the third area that i want to uh, put together is around uh, this is the time as we start working from home all of us have begun to realize we don't need visas to work for each other the russian fear not to have too many indians in their territory can now be dispelled. Can we have uh, uh, Indians working out of India for Russians, for, 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 for what Russia needs in its service sector, in its accounts, in its legal services, in its various other businesses? So I think that the work from home and the social distancing allows us a new moment to, look, to use the demographic uh, complementarities that we had, but were never able to exploit. Can we create special skilling programs that will allow Indians language skills and commercial skills to serve the Russians? By the way, this is happening with the uh, UAE. It's happening with Dubai, where this has happened. Uh, we, we have signed an agreement where our Indians are trained in Indian skilling institute to, institutions to cater to their needs. So can we think of our human capital and our demographic complementarities anew? I think this is the time to do it. The digital moment gives us this uh, possibility. And finally, I think uh, my last input for this is that uh, uh, we need to be realistic about what we can do together with China. I know Professor Lunev says that China has never attacked anyone since 1979. 1979. Let me remind you of one incident, 15th of June, 2020. So uh, very recently, China has attacked someone, has moved into our territory, has moved 40,000 troops into, uh, 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 into a land that they believe is theirs, but we claim to be ours. It has tried to use force to change the political geography of the Himalayas. So to say that the Chinese are not going to exhibit American characteristics is foolhardy. I think let's be a little realistic about what we are dealing with. The China that was promoting BRICS in 2009 is not the same China who is trying to change the geography in 2020 in India. Let's be realistic. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not even asking you to walk in my shoes. It's difficult. Uh, I'm All I'm saying is let's keep our minds open. 
that that the BRICS project was based on sovereign equality. It was based on the fact that the smallest economy like South Africa and the largest economy in the BRICS like China would have equal votes and weight in a new development bank. It was based on the fact that we will respect each other's uh, uh, dignity and 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 uh, uh, and sovereignty uh, is the premise that created BRICS still true. And I think as we move to this new decade of BRICS, one year into the new decade of BRICS, that question needs to be asked: that do we still believe that we are all equal? Do we still believe that we all have same uh, 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 sovereign rights and weight and vote? And if that question is answered in the negative, then there are limitations to those groupings. If those, if that question is answered in the positive, then that grouping has a future. The challenge before us is that can we keep BRICS relevant in this new decade when one of the members may have changed their mind on the basic underlying principle that allowed BRICS to work for 11 years? And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Samir. Um, very emotional, uh, very... Um... Pointy, and I know there are a lot of a number of uh, there are already a number of questions, uh, especially for you specifically. But uh, if you stay here for some more time, if you allow, we would have uh, Lydia Click and Suhas and Nihaydar speak, uh, and then have a wrap up questions at the end of this session, I so know, that uh, we can have a more general uh, discussion. But you're very right; it's uh, actually vital that we do address. Uh, not just uh, hard security economic questions. I'm, I'm going back to uh, to the first part of your speech, and uh, it is vital to encompass for both Russia and India uh, the fourth industrial revolution, the new technologies, and is definitely for us in uh, new. Uh, impetus to think not only technology wise, but also how do we go around this technology? Because what you mean, working distantly, how we do, do we introduce new legislation in our countries? For example, you know, there are discussions in the G20 on the uh, digital uh, uh, payment methods um, to be discussed, and we had. Uh, the State Duma discussed in its third reading uh, the legislation on uh, the digital um, methods of payment in Russia, how they are addressed, and uh, this uh, distant working of Indians in, for Russian companies or for, of Russians for Indian companies also would require some new uh, legislative thinking, new economic thinking uh, for us, not just technology. And I think there is a, a huge area for us to think. And um, obviously in today's world, if we wanna uh, keep up with their current pace, we need to do it together. There is no way that we can reach something in isolation. We can have a uh, uh, we can have a breakthrough in some smaller area, but uh, as soon as uh, we come up to a more general breakthrough, it needs partnership. And uh, uh, in fact, very briefly, uh, you've been discussing economic financial terms and one of the BRICS areas that we still need to discuss and it's there on the agenda is how we use our all our national currencies to trade mm -hmm. in BRICS. Uh, because now we cannot be relying just on uh, some mm -hmm. currencies that are not necessarily there, be it because of sanctions, be it because of other reasons. So there is a drastic need for us to um make a leapfrog on in that area um i would ask uh, uh now give the floor to dr lydia kulik head of india studies Kolkata institute of, of emerging market studies uh and also a research fellow at the Cindy center for indian studies of the institute of oriental studies of russian academy of sciences uh, i would like to ask to keep short so that we can have a more discussion, maybe five minutes. Dr. Kulik, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak and thanks for organizing uh, this discussion. Special um, words of greetings to His Excellency Ambassador Sharma and uh, Nikola Rishatovich Kudashev. And um, it's great to see so many um, distinguished speakers here um, 
great to see Mr. Sarin speak so emotionally and uh, Dr. Lunyov, thank you so much for your points. Um, looking forward to Mr. Unikrishnan speaking and uh, Dr. Shoman as well. It's really hard to um, add uh, much substance after um, very extensive speeches by the previous um, experts, but and I would like to be um, I would like to be brief, and uh, it's not very difficult to be brief after so much uh, important points have already been covered. I am agreeing on some of them, and uh, I would uh, uh, allow myself to uh, disagree with some of the points that were raised um, earlier. First of all. Um, we see after the pandemic, a lot of regional uh, forces of local gravity pulling international organizations apart. And uh, we see these forces are stronger than ever. Many countries, uh, including Russia and India, are speaking about self-reliance. Experts are discussing um, issues uh, pertaining to uh, deglobalization, uh, whether it has a chance or not. Uh, then, of course, there is uh, US-China uh, rivalry uh, obvious to everybody, uh, but at times like this, uh, BRICS um, is being tested, but at the same time, a BRICS format has an extra chance to prove its necessity. In and uh, in this respect, uh, may I say a few words of appreciation to uh, Dr. Victoria Panova and her team and uh, to the entire uh, National Committee on BRICS Research, uh, and the government agencies supporting uh, this work for a lot of efforts that are being put into uh, revising the agenda of BRICS, making it relevant, preparing uh, various uh, events. And I'm very hopeful that uh, despite being postponed, they will take place and they will um, you know, set uh, the new benchmark for uh, the work of this um, association for the future. Um, so, um, another point that um, I would like to make is uh, that there is a lot of criticism around BRICS and this criticism is um, derived from the fact that each member state of uh, BRICS associ association has its own uh, goals in this, um, in this forum. And uh, of course, uh, being very close to India, uh, we understand that uh, a lot of criticism is coming uh, from our Indian friends um, towards China. Uh, we hear that uh, BRICS is uh, used by uh, our Chinese partners for its own um, agenda. And um, while this points to some extent may be valid, I would call on um, the expert community and the media in India to exercise a little bit of uh, more uh, caution in terms of um, this very sensitive uh, issue of uh, China and uh, India rivalry, because um, while this being a very sensitive issue and I'm concurring with the Russia's official position about not taking sides in this, um, you know, very, um, uh, emotional um, engagement, um, I would like to draw everyone's attention that by uh, stressing the negativity around this relationship, we're playing into the tunes of our um, Western um, partners. Uh, it has always been their agenda to clash India with its um, big neighbor on the North uh, with China and uh, uh, I would just call on everyone not to uh, beat this uh, drums of uh, war because they are playing into the hands of uh, exactly the forces that we're trying to oppose by keeping BRICS uh, stable and um, relevant and uh, working. Uh, Russia's strategy within BRICS has always been to search for and strengthen the elements of common interests and common value for all member states. And uh, of course, Russia has been playing a very harmonizing role on all tracks of uh, BRICS work, be it political, economic, or humanitarian. And um, uh, there's probably no, there's been no more uh, relevant partnership within BRICS than Russian and uh, Indian partnership. And the entire construction of BRICS uh, rests on um, a lot of, um, you know, 
positive outlook about how multipolar world should look like and uh, it should be uh, this way going forward um, as well. Uh, another point that I would like to make is that post pandemic um, uh, the relevance of uh, United Nations uh, sustainable goals is much more uh, high and uh, UN declaration signed in uh, 2015 uh, specifying this uh, 17 goals um, has never been uh, more, uh, you know, acute and more important to many people, uh, most of the people of the world. Of course, we're talking about uh, healthcare, poverty uh, alleviation, digitalization, climate change. Um, I could see when I looked at the uh, revised version of BRICS economic partnership strategy, uh, a lot of relevance to uh, what the pandemic has uh, highlighted even further. And uh, of course, we're talking about digital transformation of the economies, um, developing cooperation, digital sphere and uh, over overcoming the digital divide, um, developing e-commerce, e-government, all the points that Dr. Saran has uh, already highlighted are all reflected in um, the um, economic uh, partnership strategy for BRICS. And uh, the pandemic has only, uh, you know, brought new um, importance to, to all these points. Um, these are also the priorities uh, for Indian-Russian cooperation as well, which again uh, brings us to the fact that uh, Russian-Indian partnership is extremely relevant to BRICS uh, in general. Um, maybe it would be um, new to our um, friends uh, in India, the fact that uh, digitalization and IT is now one of the priorities for the Russian economy. And uh, even before the pandemic has hit uh, in Russia, the new prime minister Mishustin has been appointed, who is uh, well known for being digital savvy. Uh, he is famous for reforming and uh, trans transforming uh, the Russian tax service, making it efficient and digital and probably even before digitalization has come on the front stage uh, of everyone's minds uh, following the pandemic, uh, the Russian government has had this agenda in mind and um, digitalization is definitely one of the priorities uh, for our country at this particular moment, which brings uh, Another idea which uh, Dr. Panova has touched upon, but I would like to develop it a little bit further. Um, as we uh, enter this new stage where the borders are non-existent, where uh, a lot of issues are sought by artificial intelligence and there is internet of things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, both on the level of um, civil society of individuals and on the level of um, uh, countries, associations, it is time to think about the new rules of these digital games and uh, not just within our own societies, but on a general global um, um, scale, uh, countries have to think about forming the new rules of um, play. At the moment, we see complete lawlessness. It leads to a lot of uh, problems, chaos, confusions, accusations, and uh, BRICS could have a much stronger say in setting the rules for this new digital uh, world, which we are all, you know, um, approaching and uh, which we are all hoping to make uh, good use of for the benefits of our countries and our societies. Um, just another brief point is uh, about the new development bank uh, in BRICS, which uh, has been a success. It has been uh, accepted you know, by uh, international financial experts. There are nearly 50 projects now under financing of this bank. And uh, again, uh, under the influence of pandemics, probably uh, more emphasis will have to be put on uh, innovative technologies and cross-border projects that uh, are uh, uniting uh, the BRICS uh, member states, not just uh, projects focused uh, locally. Um, another point that I would like to make is probably everyone in Russia wants to see uh, India's role in BRICS as higher, as uh, more involved, while uh, looking out of India, probably BRICS is not very high on uh, Indian uh, agenda. Um, let me uh, just give you another example uh, to, uh, you know, to say a few words of caution and uh, cautious optimism. It's not just about BRICS, uh, that India is very, um, 
um, is very cautious about. Uh, generally, India's involvement in all international association has been rather um, limited, while India is open to membership in many international fora, partly due to uh, limited resources, partly due to its own um, interests. Uh, India's involvement, for instance, in the British Commonwealth, which I have uh, studied um, you know, closer than other associations, has also been uh, you know, rather limited. And uh, um, the agents be behind these associ associations have, al have always wanted to uh, uh, to, to India to play a bigger role in uh, associations like this. At some point, um, please don't uh, uh, you know consider this example as irrelevant. But at some point, uh, Britain even wanted uh, India to be uh, the chairman um, of the Commonwealth um, of the British Commonwealth, which sounds rather strange. But because India uh, has so much um, respect in the development uh, world, to give more credibility to the entire associations, the driving uh, countries, the driving member states behind these associations may want India to play a greater role in, uh, you know, in this uh, fora. But um, it has always been India's policy to pursue its own interests and uh, to um, probably uh, take care of its uh, business interests, um, its expertise before the political interests. And while I'm also calling on um, Indian government to play a greater role in BRICS and uh, give it more attention. At the same time, uh, we have to be quite realistic. Uh, and it is not that India is forgetting BRICS, but it is just has never been a tradition uh, on the Indian uh, side, on the Indian behalf, to uh, be uh, extra active in uh, forums like this. But I hope, of course, uh, being on the Russian side, that BRICS will occupy a special um, place in the Indian foreign policy and in the hearts of uh, common Indians, as well as Mr. Saran has mentioned, uh, we have to uh, you know, promote the agenda that would reach uh, common people, that, um, that would help uh, you know, make BRICS relevant for them, um, not just for the, you know, for the government, but for elites. And here I hear the concern of Dr. Dr. Lunyov, but um, there is no conflict in some of the uh, elites in India being very uh, Western uh, focused. It is very natural. It is, you know, the way of life. Uh, it is the commonality of uh, business interests and English language. But some elite in India, of course, hopefully would be Russia focused, uh, that would know the country better, that would develop business links with Russia. And we're all, of course, working towards, uh, you know, bringing more and more of such um, role changes uh, in, uh, in India and in Russia. And let me just um, finish by uh, a few words by our Prime Minister Sergei Lavrov, who called uh, BRICS uh, a natural association and the association that was inspired by the realities of life. Uh, he also called BRICS as one of the pillars of more just and democratic world order that is being built right now. And um, on this um, optimistic uh, point, let me conclude by uh, saying that uh, you know, naturally the trends of the changing world uh, calling for multipolarity uh, would, you know, bring our countries uh, closer to each other. They will gravitate them uh, into the sphere of BRICS rather than into the regional uh, small um, islands of, you know, uh, self-reliance and uh, independence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kulik. Uh, and I should say that you've been uh, talking about uh, digital as an important area to deal with in BRICS, not just bilateral relations. And I should tell you that uh, now we are, uh, our officials are talking about discussion, uh, talking about adoption of the new strategy for economic partnerships of BRICS for the new period of 2025. And we are hoping, and it's uh, highly likely that we're going to have a special section it will be one of the three sections that would be devoted specifically to digital economy so this is high priority within BRICS and uh, um, uh, another point I uh, would like uh, th there are some other um, projects that are also discussed between the five uh, both in security and technology in uh, uh, eco economy and also social impact of, of uh, digitalization. So it's, it's very important, you're very right. 
And uh, off top, before giving the floor to our further speaker, I'd like to say that uh, you could see that our um, today's roundtable is a perfect gender equality. We are having exactly the same number of speakers from both male and female. And I think this is also uh, a very uh, timely and uh, because uh, we saw quite a lot of news which were saying that uh, those countries or those entities that were led by women who have empathy uh, are offering uh, best solutions to pandemics. But I do not personally believe in uh, this particular uh, suggestion. I would suggest that it is in the parity and in the balance of both male and female in our expertise and our uh, strength that we can uh, uh, make a breakthrough and um, win, uh, win over the difficult situations. That said, allow me to um, introduce uh, the next speaker of our uh, first session, Mrs. Suhasini Haidar, who is a national editor and diplomatic affairs editor of the Hindu the most prominent uh, newspaper of uh, India. But I should say that she's also been a very prominent journalist and worked on TV as well. And from what I know, uh, Dr. Haida uh, has all, is always listened to very carefully and all her analysis, all her articles, all her uh, evaluations are read carefully in their uh, government of India in their uh, intellectual and political elite of India and Russia, those who, who and uh, that is why uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing her insights in this particular session. Uh, Ms. Haidar, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your very kind words and for inviting me to speak over here. Uh, you know, um, the fact is that uh, sometimes it is crisis that clarifies one's priorities. And I, uh, I think that the crisis that the world faces today, the coronavirus pandemic, is something that is going to bring clarity in what our priorities are. Uh, in a way, it is a forced pause for a world on steroids. We were moving so fast. We were moving uh, quickly on so many fronts. Uh, that in fact the last four to five months, six months for some, have actually forced people to stop, uh, listen, uh, think about what it is, uh, what is the world that we have created and what is the world that is going to emerge uh, after all of this. In, in that sense, we are all uh, today in this uh, webinar as well in a kind of waiting room, waiting to find out what is going to emerge. Uh, and I think the BRICS question is just one of those. I don't think we can take it for granted that BRICS is going to continue. You know, it has always emerged uh, as a sort of um, a surprise for many because it had been written off practically the moment that BRICS as a, as a term had even been coined um, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and since then we have seen the cynicism that has followed about what does BRICS really mean? What do these countries have in common? Can they really forge anything uh, close to a consensus or is it just lip service they pay? So the fact that uh, BRICS has always outlasted its critics is something, again, that we do need to think about. Um, the, first, uh, the first part of uh, what I'd like to talk about is the kind of geopolitical uh, factors that are emerging in this crisis, uh, which will decide uh, the world and also the relevance of organizations and multilateral uh, um, arrangements like BRICS. Uh, and, and the second, really, what then should the priorities be? But I'll try and keep it very short. Uh, in terms of the geopolitical, and Dr. Saran has already spoken a little bit about the idea that we are being torn between two so-called world leaders who have not really shown the world great leadership during this pandemic. Um, uh, neither has China, where the pandemic seems to have arisen uh, apprise the world fast enough or told the world what to expect or given leadership at that time. Uh, and neither has America, e either by example or by its leadership to the world, shown us that uh, they have actually uh, in, in some way contributed uh, to the world in the middle of this uh, pandemic. Um, 
So what we do see in the absence of, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, very, very um, uh, inspiring leadership from the two global, uh, the number one and number two when it comes to the economies, is the need, the pressing need once again for the role of multipolar, uh, multi, uh, multilateral arrangements and the shift towards a multipolar world. We heard the external affairs minister, in fact, uh, speak just yesterday, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, where he actually said that the US needs to now step out of the alliances that it has gotten so used to and really think in terms of the multipolar world and engage much more in a plurilateral sense. I think what he's saying is coming literally from a kind of almost, it, it, it's almost like a centripetal force that is telling us that this is not going to work. I don't know if the world is going to be better, but we know that this one is not working right now. Um, so I think in that sense, BRICS, Russia and India particularly, are going to need uh, to do that much more to push the idea of these multilateral arrangements, as well as to talk about the various communities, because of course BRICS is a very unusual community you know, across all these continents, um, but there are communities, uh, regional communities, uh, subcontinental communities that are going to need to be pushed in terms of a special purpose alliances, trade alliances, technological alliances in particular. And I, I speak from uh, an Indian point of view and a South Asian point of view. All of uh, you who are scholars on India know that South Asia tends to be a term derided very much in our intelligentsia. But at the end of the day, when it came to the coronavirus, uh, in fact, South Asian populations had much more in common in terms of the spread of the disease in terms of the challenges they dealt with, in terms of the economic challenges we now deal with when it comes to things like the migrant population, in terms of the digital divides. So the need is now to identify those communities that are going to take us forward. Um, I will say in this that the relevance of BRICS is going to be called into question uh, for several reasons, but the particular reason is apart from the the rivalry that we have seen between the two world leaders is a real push in the world towards the buffet uh, uh, rather than the a la carte option. I'll explain that. The idea now is that no country, regardless of how independent they think they are and how autonomous they think their strategic thinking is, is being allowed to take decisions just purely in their own interest. Uh, the way the world is today, we are being actually told that we have to choose. Uh, where do we have to choose? We have to choose on defense. You either take this platform that involves all these various countries and builds coalitions between them, or you have to take the other platform. Um, in telecommunications, the world is being polarized. And let's be honest, this is, a, uh, this is about um, uh, Huawei and Chinese technology in 5G. But the fact is today that there are costs to either choosing uh, a certain technology or to not choosing that technology or to um, rejecting that technology. And both will come with great cost. Um, and I don't think we can ignore either side of that. Uh, when it comes to energy, we're being told again that you have to choose where you get your energy from. Let's not forget even a country like India that prides itself on not listening to any third party sanctions, only UN sanctions would be followed, it ended up having to zero out its oil imports from a country like Iran because of the US sanctions. Um, and so we do see this kind of pattern that you have to choose one platform or another platform. You are not any longer being to allowed to use what is in your best interest. An organization like BRICS would have to actually break through that kind of paradigm that the world is moving to. Uh, and I think it is, it, it, it really is, uh, uh, is just a question of the survival of BRICS as well. Um, because in the post coronavirus world, I don't think we are going to have the time to be part of uh, any number of organizations that don't actually value add at a time of, res of strained resources and at a time when each country is really uh, occupied with their own resurgence, with their own economic recovery. Uh, I think the third question being asked is really uh, the UN versus what? Um, uh, you know, every century or so, the world does ask itself, do we need a new world order? It was asked in, uh, in the 1830s when 
Lord Tennyson came up with the idea of Parliament of Man because colonizations and colonials were being no longer seen uh, as, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as in a positive light around the world. Uh, in the 1940s, in fact, in the, uh, because of the World War and all the destruction that was, uh, that was created, then we saw a new world order emerge. But at the end of the day, we all know that that new world order was not a fair world order. It worked, it has worked for uh, 70, 80 years um, uh, to a certain extent, but we also know that it was not representative of the entire world. It left out entire continents. It left out countries with some of the world's largest populations. It left out so much of humanity. Um, so we are going to have to move towards the idea of this new world order. What is BRICS role going to be in it? Given that the countries that make up BRICS also make up so much of humanity, uh, is there going to be a greater push from uh, the two BRICS members who are actually a part of the old world order and the UN Security Council to make this a more fair uh, new world order? Uh, and I think that will actually decide the relevance of the organization to the other members who are involved in that. Um, finally, and I have to say this as a journalist, the coronavirus pandemic has thrown up questions of how we will deal with democracy and whether democracy will just be about winning elections or will actually mean about, uh, talk about more rights, uh, more personal liberties and the other dream that uh, democracy has given people. Uh, I say this with concern because I think just the physical uh, restraints put by the coronavirus has meant uh, a lack of an opposition, uh, protests around the world, uh, journalistic freedoms, uh, national security being made, uh, uh, sort of putting, being put above any other concerns over privacy and surveillance. And I think we are going to have to look at this. I don't imagine that the BRICS countries really have a counter to this at present or would even want one because we do live in a world where most governments would actually, uh, uh, would actually be all right with a system and, uh, 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 where uh, such rights are not necessarily pushed. But I think that it is necessary to talk about them because if we are going to move towards a more human-centric growth in the world, uh, we are going to think of, have to think about it. Um, so very quickly, the, the kind of patterns I th uh, think that BRICS must prepare for. The first has been spoken about so much, the uh, problems with globalization and as a result, the global supply chains. Today, we're being told not to have global supply chains that depend on any one country. Of course, it is a Western uh, construct that we must uh, uh, reduce our dependency on, on uh, supply chains coming from the East, most notably from China. But the whole question will have to be asked about whether the new, uh, the, the counter to globalization will be a more uh, regional one, will it be more community centric and what BRICS will, uh, what kind of role BRICS will play there. I think we do need to talk about and have, and I hope that the next BRICS summit will bring about a real conversation on the future of work um, because consumption is, 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 is not going to repeat, uh, is not going to be like it was before. We are not year on year necessarily going to increase our consumption of, uh, of consumer goods um, and other things that the economy, uh, economy, especially emerging economies that make up the BRICS do uh, uh, depend on. So what is going to, to replace that? Uh, in the midst of this kind of worry about each of our countries and a kind of, if I may say so, xenophobia in them, what is going to happen to migrant laborers? I know Dr. Sarin suggested that we are going to have new ways of hiring people in different parts of the world, but particularly in India, and I'm sure in other countries, we are worried about what is the future of migration going to be and what is the loss of the remittances from our migrants going to mean for our economy? Uh, uh, all our speakers have spoken about the necessity to look at energy again, low prices right now, uh, but so will there be a diversification towards renewable energy? In a sense, all of us have seen the benefits of uh, having the coronavirus lockdown, uh, the impact on our environment. We've all seen cleaner air, cleaner water. Are we going to be able to, in a sense, preserve that? And, and what we are going to do for uh, climate change? I often say this, uh, that for the moment, SDGs have become about social distancing goals, but sooner or later, we will have to return to the idea, not just of the sustainable development goals we've already put in place, 
but the new ones which will need to marry technology, uh, which will need to marry biotechnology, even space engineering, in order to stop a future pandemic. So I'm going to leave it over there. There is a geopolitical moment here. There is an opportunity. Uh, I certainly hope that BRICS will be the organization to, to take up that opportunity. Uh, and I hope to keep this conversation going. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Haidar. Uh, we do have lots of questions already coming to us uh, all the ways. Uh, here we see only one, but uh, there are many more. And uh, before we proceed to the other session, uh, allow me to at least uh, ask the speakers to briefly respond to at least like, let's say two, three questions or maybe one of their choice. So uh, the one that you all can see is about their uh, despite that all the similarities between the countries, the progress of the format remains limited. Even the sites dedicated to BRICS initiatives are largely covering the events rather than show tangible results. Uh, so uh, Ms. Shavlai uh, mentions education, which is uh, overlooked. And so ask what particular steps are taken to improve the situation and uh, it's well known that all the BRICS members lack specialists on the corresponding countries. And so uh, ask what could be the BRIC contribution to changing the situation. We have a couple more questions coming from our audience on YouTube. Uh, one is uh, probably would be directed to Russian ones saying that in view of the current situation between India and China, how can Russia uh, respond to enhancing and protecting common BRICS interests if the situation breaks down more, or maybe if uh, Indian colleagues also want to comment on that, that could be good. Uh, another one was on uh, mentioning, Dr. Saran mentioned uh, that during this pandemic, US is awake, and we say that the fall of US has started. So, and uh, probably the last one, uh, if you'd like to respond, even multilateral world is hierarchical like in the past with bi or unipolar worlds. What is the place of Russian India in it and what role our relationship can play in that order? The other questions, but uh, we, for the sake of uh, time, uh, we will be asking to respond to them later. I know that Dr. Saran has to leave now, so I'd like you to comment very briefly. Your microphone, please turn it on. Okay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, respond to two questions, and I'm going to respond to the question Dr. Kulik did not ask me as well. So uh, very short. Uh, first, I think uh, the pandemic is a great opportunity to put together a um, knowledge hub where all of the BRICS countries can share their treatment protocols can share their city management experiences, can share their use of technology and deployment of various applications, can, uh, can create a repository of solutions, not only for each other, but for the world. I think we are doing this in any case on a larger scale through the WHO and other organizations. But if we were to create a BRICS knowledge hub around the pandemic, and since the pandemic is going to be with us for the next 18 to 24 months, I think this will be a truly important in the BRICS initiative that will make it more popular with people who otherwise think BRICS is a government to government relationship, which is meant to do big talking and does not affect our daily lives. To make BRICS more popular, let's bring it down to the people and let's do a pandemic knowledge hub. And uh, uh, Victoria, I'm happy to work with you to set this up because we've been doing this at ORF. In any case, we have a Corona tracker. Please go to our website, I'm plugging for it. Uh, so that's, that's one idea. Uh, and I think we could, we could do this across sectors, but let's start with the pandemic and the health sector. Uh, the second uh, response is on um, uh, the US decline. I think it's, I think the relative decline is unmistakable, uh, but it is still like Suhasni mentioned, uh, the largest economy in the world and which has the greatest, greatest capacity to implicate global events. And therefore uh, to suggest that the US is not one of the most, if not the most important global actor, is perhaps premature. Uh, the, the question here is, does the US imagine itself as a global power? And I think that is the larger question. What is its own self identity today? What, it, what, what is its own self imagination today? I think uh, that is uh, the, something to be seen, whether it was only for this particular administration or will it remain the same once uh, uh, November comes uh, uh, this year? 
So I think that's on the US. And finally, on uh, Dr. Kulik's point, uh, I am not uh, beating board drums, nor am I trying to play into the agenda of anyone else. I do not believe that American C-17s carried the Chinese troops to the Indian border. It was not an American conspiracy. The Chinese did not use American transportation uh, vans either. They came on their own. So it was not an American ploy to send 40,000 Chinese troops to our border. Uh, certainly, we are not... Uh, we, we met, I think the foreign minister did come to the RIC meeting, so Asni would confirm that he attended the meeting in spite of this border standoff. So we are not distracted from our global commitments, even as we respond to this bilat bilateral situation at the border and respond to the pandemic at home. Now, you may have seen less enthusiasm around the BRICS in India over the last three months because we are trying to save 1.3 billion Indians. We have a slightly bigger challenge than most countries do. Uh, curtsy our population and a per capita income of $2,000. So we are trying to work with the smallest resources to create largest safety nets for our people. It is not an easy exercise. It's a quite messy democracy. Uh, but let me tell you that there is no dampening of enthusiasm. In fact, I told Victoria that don't worry when India becomes the, chef, uh, the, uh, the think tank lead next year, we will invite Victoria to co-lead that particular year so that uh, 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 you know the Russia-India bilateral can play out over the BRICS. We will work together next year in the real and we will have Russia present in all the events that we do, taking a leadership role so that we make up for this year when we could not do too much uh, uh, together uh, in the beautiful city of Moscow and Sochi and many other lovely towns that you have. So we are committed to BRICS. We believe in the BRICS, but it does not detract from my central question. BRICS was based on sovereign equality. Has that fundamental underpinning changed? BRICS was based to oppose hegemony. It is not to support one kind of hegemony and resist another kind. I am uh, certain that as a BRICS, we are not going to replace the US as a hegemon with some other hegemon. The idea was to have a multilateral, multipolar, equitable global system. And we must continue to chase that dream and aspiration, even though as Sohasini will continue to remind us that no world order has been fair. We will continue to be with, live with unfair world orders, but we should not give up the hope of trying to make it relatively better. And I think BRICS was meant to be that change agent that makes the world relatively better. It was not supposed to cure, cure the world of every problem. It is not going to be able to do that, but it should be able to give world more choices and more options. And that was the purpose of BRICS. And I hope we continue as BRICS to provide those options, uh, create, treat everyone equally, and work on the principles of equity and equality. So I will leave you now. Thank you so much, Victoria. And I'm so sorry I'm being rude and leaving. But Lydia, I loved your comments. Thank you, Samir. And I think uh, BRICS, um, I can assure you that we will be here staying on this very uh, important principle of sovereign equality. Otherwise, you're very right, BRICS or either uh, other organization where India or Russia or other BRICS countries would be put would not make sense. So we are adhering to this principle and I'm sure, sure all the five members are adhering to, the, to this Cheers. principle Thank as you. well. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very briefly, uh, Ms. Haidar, uh, there was one specific also for you, um, just if you could say one minute, uh, how hopeful you are for the new world order when things are not changing on the ground. That's in brief. Well, I, I can only say that the, the current crisis is making people and particularly the next generation rethink everything they knew, not just about uh, order and laws, and, um, uh, uh, but about leadership itself. Uh, and if that leadership fails, and, uh, and, and I do agree, we, ha we are in a very peculiar situation where we have these uh, two uh, uh, supposed world leaders today who are heading into, um, shall we say, a, a, a cold war. And in them, we have one who seems to see their rise uh, only through uh, sort of military and strategic uh, perspective, and the other who seems to be uh, trying to counter uh, um, uh, that by, uh, by retrenching. So we have the rise of one power, the retrenchment of the other, and, um, and the rest of us will have to step up to the plate. So the answer uh, to that question is that it is for everyone who does not aspire perhaps just for leadership for themselves, but for leadership for uh, global values uh, to step up to the plate now. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Haidar. Uh, Dr. Kulik, also one minute uh, comment, if you could, e either of the questions that were asked, just pick the most dear to you. Thank you. Probably the most uh, interesting one is um, about the US-China relations and uh, the fact that both uh, India and uh, Russia probably should distance themselves. This is the um, opinion of most of the experts who speak on the subject and uh, should not uh, you know, get involved into this uh, rivalry. And uh, second point uh, is I would just generally question the idea of uh, previous speakers uh, about uh, you know China's world uh, leadership um, although of course uh, this country has gained uh, a lot of you know progress and um, uh, achievements etc but it has not aspired yet to be the uh, world leader and uh, while the US is stepping down uh, China is not just uh, being prevented from becoming their next leader, but it is not yet taking its, uh, you know, responsibilities or claiming the responsibilities of uh, the world leader. And probably China scholars would, uh, you know, could clarify this better, but uh, it does not have the ambitions of, uh, you know, leading the world. Uh, um, let's, you know, of course, we can argue whether uh, China is still, you know, um, subscribing to, um, multipolarity and uh, just and equal um, world order which BRICS is an um, embodiment of but I would still suggest that yes and uh, it is in Russia's and uh, India's uh, you know responsibility to step in while this uh, rivalry is uh, unfolding and to provide an alternative uh, which we are at this moment discussing and which we are trying to shape up. Thank you so much, Dr. Kulik. Dr. Lunev, if you allow me, I will now uh, give the floor to our next, to our, my uh, fellow uh, co-chair, Dr. Unikrishnan, because I know that you will be speaking at the second session also, so probably you could also address all the questions at the second sessions as well. And uh, I would like to thank you all the speakers that uh, so that spoke for, so far for all the wonderful, brilliant ideas and insights. And uh, I wish we had more time. And uh, uh, I'm quite sure that once we meet face to face, there will be, um, and I'm quite sure we'll do it at least if not this year, which I'm still hopeful for, but next year for sure. And we will discuss all those matters uh, that are relevant for both of our countries. Uh, Nandan? Thank you, Victoria. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, uh, at the outset, would like to say that uh, you'll have to tolerate a far more authoritarian and uh, Stalinist chair. I am not as liberal as Victoria is, so I am going to enforce the time limit. And some of you... Very nice for a change, uh, you know? <laughs> That's Indian influence on me. <laughs> So as uh, Tatyana Lvovna and uh, Nivedita surely know that I will enforce the time limit very strictly. Uh, I will also hope that Mr. Lunyov will participate in this discussion during the question answer session at least because of his wide knowledge about Indo-Russian relationships. Without further ado, I would request Tatyana Lvovna, um, Dr. Shaumian, to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, you hear me yet? I hope. Uh, thank you very much. I am very glad that I have an opportunity to participate in this uh, discussion. And I can see here my very good friends, my old friends and my new friends. And um, uh, you know, that is uh, uh, really very important things which we are discussing today. And uh, I, uh, many aspects of the India-Russian relations in the context of the coronavirus was already discussed and two of our distinguished ambassadors were talking about that and our 
um, distinguished participants also mentioned the Indian-Russian relations in this context. And therefore, um, you know, many all already had been covered. But I would like first to remind that we are talking today about very serious and very, we can say the tragic things because we did not mention now the victims of this coronavirus in both our countries. And I am uh, afraid that the number of victims, uh, uh, more than a million people already uh, covered. And therefore, when uh, Dr. Saran was talking about the different aspects of uh, India-Russian relations, and uh, of course, we, our partnership has a lot of components, you know, that is uh, politics, that is defense, and that is uh, nuclear energy, anti-terrorism cooperation, that is space cooperation, economic cooperation, but of course we should very seriously include in this list the problems of health. And now we have this opportunity, we should do that and we should discuss about the uh, cooperation in health and cooperation in uh, medical science. We should cooperation in medical technological um, subjects. We should cooperate in medicine because this new uh, situation uh, gave us the opportunity, gave us the necessity to uh, to maybe to include this aspect of uh, India-Russian relations in the agenda of our meetings and uh, of our politics and our economics cooperation and so on. And uh, I, I would like to say a few words about the some uh, some uh, real influence which uh, had. Uh, these new conditions in the context with coronavirus on our, even on our India-Russia relations, in the, even on our sphere of our relations. And we know that, uh, I, I think that in another situation, we could meet personally. We could have our meetings, we have, have our uh, uh, seminars, conferences, and so on. In such a circumstances, we, for, we should uh, maybe not to cancel that meetings, but to postpone them or to have it in such a form as, as we have it now online. And uh, we uh, plan in our institute, in our Center for Indian Studies, we maybe you know, of course, that uh, we had every year uh, in May, uh, end of May, the conference devoted to the, devoted to the uh, India studies, our Indian studies and India-Russian relations and uh, political aspects of our relationship. But this time we postponed the conference. It should be on 21st, 22nd of October. I don't know in which form, frankly speaking. Maybe it would be online uh, or it would be uh, in, in, in personal participation in that. But I think that this is important. I, I think that um, in, because of this uh, coronavirus and, and many aspects of our life was changed. And uh, on, the, uh, on the level of different levels of our relationship, uh, I think that uh, very limited contacts on the level of uh, even on business and uh, even this our scientific exchange now suffering because of this. And I'm not talking about, about tourism, which tourism now, I don't know if it's still uh, survive or not, you know, but in such a circumstances, it is, um, um, it's very, uh, situation is 
uh, and of many changes. And uh, also the, uh, uh, what kind of uh, situations in the institutions, in the universities, at schools, because- uh, General Lvovna, two minutes more. Yeah, okay. And I think that uh, in um, the India and Russia relationship, uh, very important in the, uh, uh, our common efforts to fight against coronavirus. I think that it is very important the effective cooperation in, between India and Russia and uh, not only on bilateral level, but also at the level of international groups, organizations. And we were talking a lot of about uh, on BRICS. Of course, our cooperation in the framework of BRICS is also uh, very important in Shanghai organization. Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the only common efforts we can uh, effectively fighting against this uh, uh, coronavirus danger. And uh, I think that in this case, we should also cooperate uh, with China because in all this, in many of these, our organizations, also China is also the member. And I think that in framework of BRICS, we were talking about that in Shanghai organization, I think that we should work together uh, we could like or we could dislike some things in the politics, some change in the China politics, but we should remember that in this uh, uh, fighting, we should have the common efforts because it is really very important for the future of our people, the future of our countries. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana Bovna. You've uh managed two seconds below seven minutes. I think that oh. is uh, remarkable. So uh, I would request all other speakers to follow the this course. Yeah. And without any comments, I'll reserve all my comments towards the end. I'd yeah. now ask Nivedita Kapoor to make her presentation. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'll be focusing on the impact of the pandemic on Indo-Russia relations. So we, we are all already aware of the fact that the Indo-Russia relationship is a long-standing one. It's a time-tested relationship. And over the past few years, both the le political leadership in both the countries has taken steps to ensure that this relationship improves. It has tried to address the various issues involved in the economic relationship, the defense and energy partnership as well. But what I want to focus today is on the systemic pressures that the international system is exerting on this bilateral partnership, um, the most prominent of which is the uh, expected uh, heightening of the US-China bipolarity. I would not say that these trends were not visible before the pandemic hit. But what the pandemic has done is either accelerated some of these trends that were already exerting pressure on the Indo-Russia bilateral relationship, and in some ways, it has heightened some of those other pressures. So as a result of this US, uh, US-China bipolarity, there's an increasing sense of the polarization in foreign policies of other countries as well. And because a clear bipolarity has not emerged, a clear multipolarity has not emerged either, but the post-Cold War US hegemonism does not also work very well at this stage. So in this state of confusion and in this state of flux, it is only natural that the Indo-Russia bilateral relationship is also uh, dealing, it will also have to deal with certain challenges that this situation will present on the bilateral relationship. And here I'll highlight the China factor because China plays, uh, is an important factor in the foreign policies of both India and Russia. For Russia particularly, China has become important in the post-2014 period. And we have seen a qualitative shift in the relationship of both of the uh, of uh, Russia-China relationship. Similarly, if you look at India, uh, we have looked at rising China. We have been concerned about an increasingly aggressive China in, especially when it comes to the region of Asia. 
And that has led us to focus on our foreign policy in a way where we are getting closer to the United States and other regional powers of Asia. So while the China factor is affecting foreign policies of both India and Russia, it is affecting those foreign policies in very different ways. And it is this uh, situation that both the countries will have to address. But in this changing world order, I would like to stress again that both the countries need each other. So if I argue from the opposite point of view, what if India were to lose Russia as its, key, as its close partner? Not only will we lose a long time tested friend who who supplies us with the latest defense weaponry, we will also be pushing Russia further into the hands of China. Similarly, if Russia were to lose India as its close partner, uh, it has already, its relations with the West are, are already not very well, and it is not a very strong player in Asia as of now. So it will be only left with China as the main partner, and that would be negative for Russia's aim of achieving a multi-vector foreign policy. Also, India and Russia cooperate on several other strategic issues, uh, say on Central Asia, on issues of say counterterrorism, on Afghanistan. We do need to cooperate with each other. So, in the long-term strategic sense, India and Russia will have to put a lot of energies to ensure that their bilateral relationship continues to be strong, despite the fact that currently, because of the uh, sort of confusing situation that the world order is in, it might look difficult to sustain the relationship at the levels that it used to be. But it's important to keep the long-term strategic perspective in mind. Uh, and this is also important because neither India nor Russia want to get into an alliance relationship with other partners. We both, both the middle powers want to have broad-based diversified foreign policy. And for that, we need to, uh, to ensure that our bilateral relationship remains strong. And I'll very quickly also touch upon how this systemic uh, pressure is being exerted on BRICS as well, and how India and Russia interact within the BRICS format as well. We already know that BRICS has done pretty well in terms of institutionalization of the, in the economic and the financial sector. Uh, but uh, I remember when uh, Russia took over the presidency of BRICS last year, it said that one of its aims would be to increase the foreign policy coordination among, amongst the BRICS members. Now that goal seems to be increasingly elusive, primarily because of how the Indochina relationship has panned out, especially after uh, the recent clashes on the border. It has made India more concerned about uh, Chinese intentions with vis-a-vis India and of course broadly uh, towards the broader region. And this problem for BRICS is not new, that it does very well on the economic and the financial sector, but when it comes to issues of geopolitical concern, strategic concern, uh, if I, I urge you to go to the BRICS declarations, you will realize that on issues of regional importance, uh, on any strategic issues, the language is very perfunctory. The most the BRICS countries do is they express concern about situations in different parts of the world. While in contrast, if you look at the economic and the financial sector, you can clearly see specific projects that emerge out of BRICS. So, so it was already clear for BRICS countries that um, that while they can cooperate on certain areas of economic development, hey, the third two minutes. Yes, sir. Strategic issues are a little difficult uh, for BRICS to address as a whole. And I've read several Russian scholars also raise this question. Uh, as to the fact that how can BRICS become an important voice in international strategic affairs, especially uh, especially uh, if the Indochina equation is not smoothened out because uh, their foreign policy seem to be increasingly diverging. So the question for BRICS now emerges is if it cannot cooperate on key geopolitical uh, agenda, does it agree to cooperate to to limit its cooperation uh, to the economic and financial sector uh, in order to preserve the unity of the organization. That will definitely limit its voice uh, in the international arena. Uh, but that's a question that BRICS will have to address in the future. I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nivedita. <clears throat> uh, there are uh, several questions which, of course, come up as uh, a result of the first two presentations. But nevertheless, again, as I said, 
we'll look at all of it towards the end. Well, let me get uh, Alexei Kupriyanov into the conversation and let us hear what he has to say. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, is it okay? It's okay, it's okay. Okay, okay, thank you, Nadan. Being the last to speak is terrible because almost everything you wanted to say has already been said by others. But uh, nevertheless, uh, first of all, I want to start by saying that I'm not sure that we are now seeing the formation of new world order. If we understand the world order as a system of institutions and generally accepts rules. In fact, the previous rules and institutions persist because the United Nations is in place. Now one of the existing institutions has collapsed. Now one of the international practices is something new that hasn't been in use since 1945 uh, when the current world order was created. I personally do not see anything new except for the struggle the, for hegemony between the two superpowers, uh, between the framework, uh, within the framework of the existing world order. But at the same time, we see the security of Asia, the century, uh, century of Asia, the center of decline of the West. And this is a long strategic process, I think, uh, superimposed by the pandemic of the coronavirus, which put an end to the illusion of free trade and globalization. And we see the United States China rivalry. Personally, I see two possible strategic long term scenarios. I would call them slow and fast. The slow scenario implies a gradual transformation of world institutions toward greater influence of Asian countries, a fast one, a radical transformation as a result of which a new world order will be created, where Asian countries will play a big, bigger role. In the second option, I think we will inevitably face the transformation of the BRICS into a more institutionalized structure of global governance because non-Western countries, which play a large role, will increasingly require a platform for consultations. And now BRICS is the only platform where the main non-Western countries can discuss current problems in the club. Uh, it's very possible that the BRICS will become a key element of the future world order. In both scenarios, Russia and India are mutually interested in strengthening each other. I think strengthening each other influence in order to support each other. In particular, Russia is interested in India getting the seat of permanent member in Security Council so that it's officially recognized as a nuclear power, I think, so that we see not the implementation of the Chinese option, polycentric world, unipolar Asia, but implementation of the option, polycentric world and polycentric Asia. In the second scenario, Russia and India will turn into be two main pillars of the emerging world order. In my opinion, the future of uh, Russian-India relations also will be greatly influenced by the rivalry between China and the United States, <coughs> because Russia and India control the main Chinese lines of communication. In the Indian Ocean, India controls the oil and gas supply line from the Gulf countries to China. Africa-China lane is the route along which China, Chinese goods go to Europe, while Russia controls the northern route. Accordingly, by coordination actions, Russia and India will be able to achieve the greater cumulative effect. Plus, stall appearance we will see in the near future, I think, the formation of visible spheres of influence and the use of economy as another field of interstate rivalry. The most important thing now, in my opinion, is not to be drawn into rivalry between China and the United States, because both Russia and India can join it only as junior partners of one of the parties, and this is too risky. If China and the United States continue the rivalry, we would benefit from this, similar to how India, for example, benefited first from the economic confrontation between China and the United States, and then from the beginning of the new Cold War, uh, providing the territory for American manufacturers that are being withdrawn from China. Uh, this is the path that allowed many countries to rise in their time during the Cold War, and uh, the path of junior ally can bring advantages, but it's rather dangerous because you, you risk uh, or sacrifice your interest for the interest of your ally, as happened with Britain during Cold War, or get advantages, but then face your allies in new confrontation, because you will become too strong. So the main goal in this situation is to be aware of your own interest and not listen to those who call to immediately join 
one or other side. We don't know yet who will be winner. It's, there is no point in gambling your future. And we will strengthen our position if we coordinate it also in, uh, in the BRICS framework. It's important to consider the impact of uh, coronavirus epidemic on this situation. I do not see that the coronavirus epidemic has damaged or will damage our relationship. But this is a reminder to us to work together to develop a strong medical, uh, develop a system to help cope with future pandemics. Russia and India have a medical school, both traditional epidemiological. Russian doctors have repeatedly helped Indians cope with epidemics. And uh, now many Indians are studying in Russian universities, medical universities. I believe this is a good uh, incentive for the development of relations in this area. This is China is a leading manufacturer of uh, precursors. India is a world leader of pharma. And Radia, Russia is a leader uh, in fighting against epidemics. But we interact very weakly within the BRICS. Uh, it so happened historically that in all the BRICS countries, there is a large number of endemic diseases and uh, establish a system of combating them. At the same time, the BRICS level, our cooperation look very weak. For example, recent medical forums uh, were focused on traditional medicine. It's a good topic, of course, but uh, not when is a pandemic around. And you need to understand that this pandemic is not the last. The next one must, uh, must be met fully armed. Uh, and India and Russia should be initiators, I think, in this matter. A BRICS medical rapid response force maybe could be created, including floating hospitals, operating as a BRICS countries and third countries. Uh, soft power is transmitted much better through the medicine than through Bollywood, I think. In general, well, in my opinion, we need cooperation on three main lines, which will determine who will become the leaders of, of um, well, world in 50 or 100 years. This is medicine, education, and high-tech research in various fields, from energy to military. The coronavirus epidemic uh, very well demonstrated the importance of cooperation here. We saw the elites of most states quickly closed their borders and uh, are saving themselves. Uh, and few people help each other. This is good for maintaining internal stability, but bad when it comes to finding durable solutions, where the coordination of efforts of several countries is needed. We must concentrate on these three aspects, I think. We must become the, they might become the main lines. And of course, we must continue expert collaboration. Two minutes. Yeah. I'm finishing. Must continue expert collaborations, academic collaborations in the current era when international in, International structures like the BRICS can either disappear or become the pillars of new world order. It's very important to understand exactly how they transform, how they can transform, and what we want from them. Thank you, Nandan. That's all. Thank you, Alexei. That was uh, uh, very short and sweet, as they say, and I think also very, very clear. <clears throat> Before I proceed to make uh, some of my remarks, I would like to, first of all, welcome several of the participants who have waited patiently, particularly, uh, I'll start with the Indians, uh, Vice Admiral Murlidharan, I can see. I see uh, Lieutenant General Arun Zahani, as well as uh, General Ashok Mehta. And of course, I see uh, Professor Yarigina and Archom Lukin. So all of you, I'm really grateful that you've shown uh, so much patience and uh, waiting and listening to us. Before I move on to the questions and I have spoken to the organizers and I'm allowed to overrun for another 20 minutes of time, I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, in this session, what we've really done is we've taken some global issues and some bilateral issues, and we are trying desperately to see if we can get these together. And uh, to me, it appears that uh, there are some things on which we all agree. I mean, one is that the global order is in a state of churn, that the new global order has not drawn itself. And as Alexei said, many of the old institutions are still uh, the institutions through which we are trying to mediate our problems. Although everyone, and this is the peculiarity of the current situation, uh, the ex-hegemon, the future hegemon, and all the others around them, everyone is unhappy with the current state of affairs. So one common factor is a general unhappiness, dissatisfaction with the way the world is. That is very good. I don't mean very good in that, that sense, but I'm saying that is something we all agree on. Uh, the second thing is, where does that 
place India-Russia relations. And this is something I think that we have to be very honest and open with each other about. We definitely differ with each other on how we view China. We definitely differ with each other on how we view the United States. India's perception is governed by the fact that it sees its relationship with China currently uh, in an adversarial atmosphere. Although in the long run, the Indians do recognize that China could and should maybe have an important role in uh, India's developmental story. Uh, similarly, the same is the approach to the United States. The additional factor is that Russia, India sees the United States as a significant force that would help balance uh, the rise of China uh, within the Asian space. In fact, now there is a new concept called the greater Eurasian space. Uh, the Russians, unfortunately, or for, uh, are in a different situation. They have a long standing, and I agree with Mr. Lunyov, 500 year old adversarial relationship with the West, uh, which has become a little bit more exacerbated since 2014. Uh, it has forced them to develop ties with other uh, countries. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, one of the ties where countries with whom they have developed a very strong relationship is China. And this is where the problem comes into our bilateral relationship. How much can India rely on Russia to balance China? If you go back to the 60s, where our relationship with the uh, Russia, Soviet Union began, and particularly if you come to the 70s, it was very clear that uh, we expected Russia, Soviet Union to balance our relationship with our adversaries, and which was even then after 62, particularly China. Today, that situation, there is a certain amount of, uh, <clears throat> I, I won't say suspicion, but there is certain concerns about the level at which we can trust each other. <clears throat> Sorry. So it is this question, I think, that we all need to analyze and see further. But more than that, there is an overriding factor, which I think is also equally important that whatever the world order that emerges, be it a G2, be it a multipolar world, be it an asymmetrical multipolar world, whatever discussions you want to have, the point is that the India-Russia relationship could be and should be an important axis that could contribute to the stability of the emerging new world order. There are many factors that are common between us despite some concerns that have cropped up, which could contribute towards creating this new, new world order. Once upon a time, I was one of the proponents who believed that the new Eurasian order could be discussed. The new Euro Asian architecture could be discussed through RIC. Today, I'm not such an art, uh, ardent enthusiast about the RIC format because I see a fundamental distrust between two players. China and India. I mean, however much Russia may want us to uh, not uh, be hostile to each other, the point is these, uh, the recent confrontation has changed the paradigm in which India-China relationship operates. It is going to take a long, long time to get back to some kind of business as normal. So I think to sum up, what I'm saying is there are many unanswered questions and one of those, and what the main question there is, how are India and Russia reinvent the understanding of their relationship in an uncertain evolving new world order? And how do they insulate each other from some of the strategic pushes and pulls that they face in their bilateral relationships with other countries? I mean, and as I said, China and US primarily. I don't think we have paid enough attention to these questions. And we seem to think that there is some inherent 
internal dynamic in the india russia relationship that will automatically make it float and will automatically make it rise i don't think so i think we need to create new institutions of interactions i think we need to be far more proactive if we want this relationship to survive now with that i will open the floor to questions but first i know that mr lunyov <clears throat> had some comments to make and so therefore i will give him the floor but i will restrict him to 5 minutes mr lunyov the floor is yours you have to unmute yourself you have to unmute yourself sergey yes. i'm so, i'm sorry thank you very much uh thank you very much uh for the opportunity you gave to me i'll be uh, rather short i would like to speak about this quote uh russia china india and uh the united states i absolutely agree with all the experts uh, who said already that the far india and russia are from the uh, american chinese quarrel the better for our countries it's for sure uh you should also understand my position i consider that Russia is too close to China. Otherwise, I still believe in the potential of Russia in the China triangle. triangle. And uh, I think uh, that uh, Russia is uh, the country that most keen to smooth the relations between in uh, between China and India. and the united states is the country that is the most keen one uh, to aggravate the situation and of course russia has practically no chances uh, to do anything with it uh, as uh, uh, we should be in mind that asian giants are extremely cautious about any attempt to meddle in their bilateral disputes so the only thing uh, russia can do is for example to inform uh, india about the history of uh, russian chinese border talks uh, it was said today about uh, the recent situation on the border between uh, china and india i have to uh, recall you about uh, island damanski in 1969 when uh, 59 uh, soviet boat guards were killed and two chinese divisions was eliminated were, were eliminated and uh, now island damanski is a part of china but there are practically no voices in russia ag against uh, this uh, decision of the border question uh, so it's necessary to do everything just to give some confidence between india and china uh, it's my position and uh, yes we should uh think about uh the words of arthashastra about your neighbor is your friend the neighbor of your neighbor uh is your enemy the neighbor of uh, your neighbor is a friend so russia and india are real friends indeed have neighbors such as china or uh the islamic world the islamic world uh but it's uh it will be positive to use the potential of this triangle uh i have uh, no time so i would not speak about uh, the whole russian indian relations if i have 2 minutes i speak about cultural and humanitarian sphere it's possible to be a rather short about it if we speak about political economic or military political uh situation it will take one hour i think can i speak to minutes about 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. One and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You see, it's a, a very interesting point uh, because we were very close uh, in this humanitarian sphere in the Soviet times, and we are rather far today. And uh, it's a great pity. It's a great pity. It's a problem of absolutely uh, different questions. Uh, for example, the majority of people in Russia haven't yet realized the threat posed by information wars and information influence. Uh, and there is reason to believe that such a war is already being waged against the Russian Federation. In the post-bipolar period, the Russian Federation didn't actually take any actions to improve its own image abroad. Its image for the whole world was formed and is forming exclusively by the West, whose main method was and remains a complete denigration of Russian reality and history. Electronic and print media in the West are striking in their hostility to Russia. There is almost no positive coverage of its policy. All this information is sent to non-Western countries, including India, where the attitude towards Russia is also getting worse. And uh, from this point of view, it's absolutely necessary to do something. There are practically no Indian journalists in Russia. There are no Russian journalists in India. And uh, uh, we see an accurate shortage of information. Mm. And by the way, uh, this uh, new online methods can give us the possibility to improve the situation. Uh, I agree with Dr. Kulik, who spoke a lot about these old digital uh, things, uh, but it's absolutely uh, necessary uh, to make uh, the Russian India mass media uh, to perform its primary function of coverage of events that take place in two countries, two countries. And the same about uh, the question with the education, with education. Uh, these online methods uh, can give us an opportunity uh, to bring together uh, Russian and Indian, uh, not only scholars, but students and well. Uh, so it will give a uh, very good impact upon the whole situation. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey. I'm sorry to interrupt you like this, but, you know, we are really running short of time. Uh, if we well, are... No, no, I, I am just an Indian now. When I <laughs> began speaking, it's very difficult to stop me. <laughs> uh, well, uh, now uh, I have uh, one question in my chat box. Since I don't have access to the uh, YouTube uh, uh, question uh, box. So the one question I have here is about the line of credit that uh, India had extended last year to the Russian Far East. That Nivedita will look after. But if uh, Admiral Murlidharan has any question he would like to ask, I'd like to give him the floor. Unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, Nandan. It's been uh, very, very fascinating to listen to different points of view. Uh, firstly, I would say I agree totally with Alexi when he says, you know, we got to look at the maritime frontier. What he said very correctly, uh, you know, the, the oil flow through the Indian Ocean region as well as through the Pacific. So these are two areas, I think, an Indo-Russian cooperation can completely look at this gamut. And it's very, very important. When you look at all that uh, ports that say China is trying to build on the others, the Belt and Road Initiative, all this is linked because in my view, uh, they're not very confident of being at sea. That is one point. The other one is uh, what I get gathered from the conversation and Sergey is, you know, nearly two decades ago, I was the I happened to be serving the Embassy of India as the uh, naval attaché. At that time, my Russian friends used to tell me that, you know, we are not hesitant. Uh, we are very confident of giving even the latest weaponry and systems 
to India because you'll never pose a threat to us. But we are a little hesitant to give it to China because we share borders and they could very much be a threat to us. But in today's uh, discussions, and especially what Sergey mentioned, I mean, of course, things change. It's almost 15, 20 years. But there's a subtle change that has happened in the uh, Russian-Chinese relationship. Thank you, Nandan. Oh, sorry. Thank you, sir. And let me just summarize some of the questions that I've seen. And then maybe uh, uh, I could assign one or two of them. And the rest, uh, the presenters could answer on their own. The first, of course, was about the line of credit. Nivedita will speak on that. Uh, there was a question about uh, the role of... One second, let me look at it again. Uh, the uh, How India and Russia can improve their relations if they are geographically very separated and don't have any important issues to assist each other, uh, particularly even like Afghanistan, uh, India and Russia are not necessarily on the same page and India, Russia is, India is not very involved there. This question is addressed specifically to uh, Dr. Kolik. Then there is another set of questions, of course, all of them deal with the uh, Russia-China relationship and its impact on the bilateral India-Russia relationship. And there is one very interesting question is uh, from an Indian academic. What is the state of affairs with the Russian vaccine for COVID-19? So now these two questions, I would suggest the Russian participants divide amongst themselves. Meanwhile, let me start by asking Dr. Kulik to answer the question on uh, India-Russia relations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Unikrishnan. Uh, in fact, these two questions are related and it was already covered by um, previous speakers. Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Kupriyanov has spoken extensively on the new uh, frontiers of cooperation lying in the medical sphere, and I totally agree with him. And uh, this is one important uh, area that uh, two countries should explore closer. Uh, if we, um, this is also related to what uh, Dr. Unyov has said, all the coverage of Russia in the Western media also reaching the Asian countries like India is totally negative. Uh, all Russia's achievements in uh, fighting the pandemic, uh, in uh, developing the vaccine are totally neglected uh, in the West. And uh, I doubt uh, that they are covered uh, in the Indian media, at least I'm not seeing uh, much coverage at all. And uh, similarly, we see a lot of uh, negativity about um, India in the Western media, um, be it because of you know Narendra Modi's leadership uh, and a lot of criticism that he's facing, but then the entire country is uh, uh, covered in a rather you know, negative uh, light uh, at this particular moment. And uh, uh, the achievements of India in fighting the pan pandemic uh, are also not reflected uh, if, we, um, if we read uh, Western coverage. In this uh, regard, uh, we have a lot to say, you know, to um, to our BRICS partners and to uh, to each other and to cooperate uh, in this sphere, which is uh, slightly neg neglected in, in this particular moment. Uh, we know, uh, for instance, that India is very strong in uh, producing vaccines. Uh, you know, at this moment, uh, millions of doses of vaccine are already produced in India and they're just waiting to be approved. And then the market uh, is uh, at least partially, you know, satisfied um, the, de the market demand is at least partially satisfied with uh, India's production. In the meantime, Russia's fundamental research in terms of, you know, uh, infectious diseases and uh, development of vaccines is al also quite strong, which are obviously, you know, the um, factors of synergy that could be exploited. Uh, there was also a question about uh, Afghanistan, but, uh, you know, given a uh, very sensitive nature of uh, uh, Indian-Chinese relations uh, this particular moment, I would just say that um, uh, I'm still hopeful about RIG format uh, in terms of stabilizing greater Eurasia, although there is a lot of criticism um, and uh, a lot of doubt whether this format could work and could stabilize this um, uh, very important areas of um, 
Pakistan, Afghanistan, Central Asia for the benefit of security for India and Russia. I would say that uh, um, dialogue is important and uh, I would agree with what uh, Dr. Shoman has said um, that uh, it is absolutely essential to keep the dialogue on and uh, um, Russia and India could uh, you know, play a very important role in um, stabilizing Great Eurasia to each, other, to each other's benefit. Thank you, Dr. Kalik. And Nivedita, can I ask you to answer Artyom Lukin's question about the line of credit? Uh, yes, sir. It's actually a very short answer because as of now, uh, the latest information that I have is that both the sides are still looking at the modalities and they're working out these modalities for the disbursement of the $1 billion loan. But as of now, they no Indian company has uh, has uh, put forth its proposal to make use of this line of credit. So as of now, nothing has happened on the ground. We are still looking at working out the preliminary conditions. Okay, then with that, I will try to just in about two words, uh, summarize what we have been discussing today. We seem to have agreed that there is uh, uh, much change happening in the world. We seem to have agreed that the Indo-Russian relationship has a very solid foundation. We also seem to have agreed that it is necessary for us not to lose this relationship and that we have to reinvent or invent new ways of taking this relationship to another level, to making sure that this relationship contributes towards the creation of a stabler new world. Uh, now that we have so much in common and a common understanding of where we are headed, what is probably left is for us to, in our next meeting, actually try and flesh out some concrete methods of getting to this goal. Yes, uh, some of the speakers, Dr. Saran, uh, Mr. Kuprianov, Lydia Kulik, have outlined some of the specific measures that we could undertake to A, diversify this relationship away from the security and defense aspect and bring in other elements into it, which is also very important. And ultimately, I will take you back to the original point, is that when we are discussing a stable, uh, uh, a stable and uh, a prosperous greater Eurasia, I think we are all discussing first and primarily from a security aspect. And the Indo-Pacific and Greater Eurasia are complementary in my worldview. So therefore, I think we cannot run away from this security aspect, and it is something that we have to address. But I'm sure we will have many more such meetings, and I hope we do have many more such meetings, utilizing the wonderful technologies that we now have access to. And I look forward to seeing you again on this platform or on an ORF platform to discuss further the intricacies of our bilateral relationship. Thank you very much for your contributions and join me in thanking the presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you, and it was great to round table, I believe. Thank you. Questions coming from YouTube. Um, but uh, I, I, we, we've already ran over time by like at least, sorry, I changed my location. I have a next meeting now. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I will ask to send those uh, questions to our speakers so that we can have a sustained discussion and it will all be on our side. And please, one more thing. Uh, as we've discussed in the very beginning, we've been um, talking about continuity of our engagement with the, the BRICS and the importance of the Russian-India cooperation within this format and uh, as it is. And please make sure that um, uh, you participate in our celebrate process. We are having a series of online roundtables on all uh, and a variety of topics. Yes, and here you see in chat their uh, site, which you can, where you can join and uh, offer your recommendations. And uh, I'm still keeping some slight hope that we can ha arrange for a face-to-face -face meeting in September, October this year. 
and the dates will be also put on the site. And we're looking forward to very fruitful engagement. And yes, India remains a very important partner for us and our uh, most trusted friends. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.